Thank you for coming to hear about these wonderful uh, guitars uh, out there being made by uh, European guitar builders. Um, I am going to be talking about the North American experience since that's where I did my participant observation and interviews uh, with guitar makers. Um, I'm the author of this book, uh, Catherine Dudley. I'm also a professor of anthropology and American studies at Yale University where I teach courses on the cultures of work, um, global uh, economies, and um, inequality uh, in global markets. So those are topics that guitar building touches on, um, right? Trying to make a living at a very old craft in a contemporary global economy is no easy thing. Um, and yet there are hundreds of people who are doing it um, in every country uh, as a profession and they're able to make a living at it and thousands more that are doing it as hobbies um, in their spare time uh, and also doing it out of a sense of commitment uh, that became very interesting to me uh, as an anthropologist. But I have to confess that I didn't start this project as an academic looking for a project. I was a guitar player looking for a new guitar. Uh, and I found myself going to guitar shops and asking a lot of questions and going to more guitar shops and asking more questions. And the more I got into it and the more I began talking uh, to guitar builders, the more interesting it became. Uh, and before I knew it, I had, I had started uh, another research project um, and it turned into, it turned into this book. Um, so I guess what I'd, like to, I, what I'd like to talk with you about today and leave some plenty of time for questions and don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me if, if you have a question. I'm just going to close the window. Okay. Uh, I thought we'd talk a little bit about, about why, why guitar makers do this when it is such a challenge economically uh, and then talk a little bit about the difference between an artisanal guitar uh, and a guitar made in a factory. Uh, and then end up with some kind of reflections of my own, uh, as well as observations that I've made talking to plenty of players and um, collectors about why they, why they buy handmade guitars and what, what is magical for them uh, in that experience with these, with these instruments. So to begin, thinking in terms of right, why, why would a builder kind of risk um, their financial livelihood um, sometimes their marriages uh, to pursue uh, a very risky profession, right? There's a certain courage um, that that takes. And that to me was a very, a very compelling question. Um, and yet it was very hard for builders to talk about this um, in a straightforward way. Uh, often they would just tell me they couldn't help themselves, right? They made guitars because I'm just addicted to it. I made one and I can't stop. Um, or they would tell me, right, I have, I have a disorder, uh, you know, a mental illness. <laughs> I'm, I'm obsessive about this and I'm obsessed with guitars and I've been obsessed with guitars for as long as I can remember, so I just have to do this. Um, others would kind of crack jokes about, you know, how, you know, they, well, about the, I think one that, that, that sticks with my mind is, you know, the question of, you know, how, how, what makes a guitar maker go broke? Well, he breaks up with his girlfriend. <laughs> with the implication that, right, his spouse or uh, partner uh, is supporting uh, the endeavor. And that's, that's, not an unusual, that's not an unusual family arrangement uh, in a builder's, especially early in a builder's career, where they're just getting started and they need, they need that extra income uh, in order to make it happen. And I think that what all of that just makes you so aware of is that there is something about this craft that is pushing, pushing back against some dominant cultural expectations about how you're supposed to be uh, in terms of your gender or masculinity. You're supposed to be the breadwinner in the family and do whatever it takes to do that. Well, guitar makers are pushing back against that. Um, and I think they're also pushing back against a particular kind of work. Right? Many of them talked about trying to find a job in the mainstream economy and just not being able to do it. Right? I can't sit in this office. I can't sit in this cubicle. I've got to be working with my hands. I need to be doing something where there's not a boss t 
telling me what to do. Um, and, you know, that, that decision to kind of leave the mainstream job market, you know, is a very, uh, you know, a very frightening and, and courageous one. It's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make this on my own. And I'm gonna, so, like, what are the reasons for that? I think s some of the reasons are pretty basic uh, in the sense that it's, you know, I, I want to feel creative, right? And I want to feel that um, my own original ideas are something that I, I can explore. I don't want to just take somebody else's idea and figure out how to make it happen. I want to figure out my own ideas and take them someplace new, someplace unexpected. And I often, guitar makers will talk about this as, it, they'll use the metaphor, they'll say, well, it's, it's, like, it's like having a child. A guitar, a guitar isn't made, it's, it's born, right? It comes to life. And right, my guitars are like my children. They're going out there into the world, um, and I'm so proud of them. And that, this language is very common. I don't know if it is for you here in Europe to talk about your guitar as being like a child, or um, if you think of it as being alive and having a life of its own. Um, but this was a very common expression uh, in Canada and the United States. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this is really the way that, the best way uh, that guitar makers can talk about their emotional connections. To what they're doing. Right? It, I think it's difficult. Um, I, I interviewed plenty of uh, women who are guitar makers, but I think it was particularly <coughs> difficult for the men to talk about their emotional connections to what they're doing. And yet, I think to a person, this was really a big part of it, of wanting to be in a particular kind of relationship to the product of your labor. Um, to be able to, to think of it as something, right, that you are connected to. And often people would use the, right, the story of Pinocchio to talk about this, uh, right? The, for those of you who did not read Pinocchio when you were a kid, right, this is the story of Geppetto, the, the old wood carver, um, and Pinocchio, his rascally puppet, who as soon as he gets, as soon as Geppetto makes this puppet, G Pinocchio jumps off the workbench and runs away from home and gets into all sort of trouble. Right? And finally, and with some help by the Blue Fairy, uh, Pinocchio grows up, comes home to take care of Geppetto, and turns into a human boy, um, Geppetto's son. And, you know, it's a, it's a lovely story. It was a story that was written in Italy in the, um, in the, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in Italy. And although I read a lot of literary criticism on the subject of Pinocchio, I have not found uh, anyone who has put two and two together and said maybe this story, maybe this story is about artisans who are resisting a vision of the Industrial Revolution and the kinds of changes that that wrought on the countryside and for for countless number of artisans throughout the country, uh, as their work, be as what they made by hand. Um, became commodities that could be produced in a factory as their labor became commodified and regimented and controlled uh, in a factory. So I started to think of this as an allegory of the hopes and fears um, that guitar makers have about their own work since it was such a common, a common image. And, you know, the hope is that, you know, just as they are putting kind of their soul into this, making the best instrument they can, handing it off to uh, a guitar player. Um, they're, ho they're hoping that the guitar player is going to value their instrument in the same way that they do. Right? They, want the, they want the guitar player to recognize it's not a copy. Right? It's, it's a, an original instrument with its own unique qualities. They want the player to spend some time with it really get to know it, bond with it, <laughs> and, you know, make it, make it their own and maybe even have it for, maybe even have it for a lifetime and pass it on uh, to the next generation, right? That's kind of a dream that many, many builders talked about, you know, and so I think that there's, right, that's, that's the dream, right? And it, it's a kind of a dream of keeping the guitar, um, 
in a personal relationship rather than letting it become a commodity and being valued only in terms of its price. One of the things that happened in North America, I don't know if it was true uh, here in Europe, but in the 1990s and 2000s, um, when it was just becoming really hot to have a, you know, a handmade guitar from some of the top makers, a lot of the money was moving out of the vintage market into the artisanal guitar market. And top builders had waiting lists that started to grow from two years to th three years to on out to 10 years. And over that period of time, they were raising the price of their instruments by hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. But people who were on the waiting list were guaranteed the price right, that they had originally contracted for. So it was the case that many buyers were getting these instruments and then realizing, hey, I can sell this on eBay and I can actually double my money, right? <laughs> I, bought it, I bought it for $4,000, now this builder is really hot, I can sell it for $10,000. And so they'd flip it and sell it. Um, this, was, this was so anguishing and distressing uh, to the builders that I talked to who were in that situation. You know, not only just peeved that Right, this buyer is making a profit on their own labor, right? But that they're thinking about the guitar in those terms, right? As something that just, I'm mean, making an investment, I can flip, I can sell, um, I'm gonna make a profit, right? That whole mentality um, is devaluing what they, were putting, what they were putting into it. So I think that there, you know, there's a way that we can say that it's precisely that set of values, that mindset, that guitar makers are really actively trying to resist. Right? They don't want you to see this as just a commodity. So when I think about the difference between artisanal and industrial um, guitar making, I think it really comes down to a set of values about how, right, how a guitar um, is made, what it's made with, and, and who can make it, right? So the values that I, th I'd, I'd like to read, uh, I read a quote um, from uh, a guitar maker by the name of Alfredo Velasquez, uh, who is the son of Manuel Velasquez, a Puerto Rican builder. Uh, and I, I just listen, listen to how he describes his father's work. Um, they're classical guitar makers, um, and of course working with rare, rare tunewoods and making it. Um, I'll, just read a, I'll just read a section of that quote, but be listening to, listen to how he's describing artisanal values, okay? Be an anthropologist. <laughs> See if you hear what I hear. So I asked, I asked Alfredo, what makes you different from a large factory? And he says, I think it's, I think it's just personal. It's the way we integrate ourselves with each piece of wood, how we calibrate and fashion the wood the way we want it, not to have a general look or have a general effect. Um, each instrument, we personalize it the way we want to, and I tell everybody that the reason why my father is so admired is because he leaves a piece of his soul in every guitar. So I asked him, what does that mean, right, to leave your soul in an instrument? And Alfredo says, he grabs a piece of wood and he's like, how do you say it? He talks to it very romantically. He listens to what the piece of wood wants to be. Because he'll take a, a piece of wood and look at it, not just looking at how it looks, but how the grain is going to go. He literally will take an hour or two hours. And sometimes I've seen him take almost a whole week looking at the same piece of wood, wondering, asking, how am I going to glue this? How am I going to take care of it? And then when he starts working on it, he has general measurements. But after he gets it up to a certain point, that's when he starts going by touch, calibrating it uh, the way he wants to. So that, for me, summed up in a very real way um, what many other builders had said. And I think there are there are three, three values that we can kind of draw out from that kind of, that kind of sentiment um, to guitar making. 
And I think the first is the feeling that um, guitars are a member of the family. Um, there are, there are, this book is full of so many quotes where, where that expression is used. So what, what, how, how, how can we think about that? My sense is it is a way of talking about the value of the uniqueness of each instrument. Right? That each instrument is, is different. No two are exactly alike. Right? And there's a special feeling of right, the, the pricelessness of that uniqueness. Right? The same way you would feel toward a child or a family pet. Um, that is so different than right, the industrial mindset and the fundamental premise on which mass consumer markets operate, which is right, the idea that everything has to be identical. It has to be interchangeable. A consumer market wouldn't operate if the consumer couldn't make the assumption, well, it doesn't matter which one I take off the shelf or which one I order online because they're all the same. Right? So our mainstream markets operate on the assumption of interchangeability. That is not what's happening in an artisanal guitar market. It seems to me the second value, um, which we heard, right, was the notion that you're talking to wood and you're listening to it. Right? That seems to me to be a value that's saying this wood is lively. Right? It, has, it has a life of its own. It is unique and it has some, it has qualities that right, I'm going to try to enhance rather than suppress. I'm going to say there's something in that wood that I'm going to bring out. It's a liveliness, a lively interaction with the wood. Right? Again, very different from uh, the perspective in an industrial manufacturer, which is you cut the tree down, you've got some pieces of wood, the wood is dead. It doesn't matter. Right? You're going to, you're going to, the parts you're going to cut out of that wood are going to be exactly the same size for every piece of wood, and we're going to do it exactly the same way. Right? So there's a sense here of the liveliness, of the possibilities of the wood, and then a sense of the, the deadness, that I can impose something on this, my ideas of what it should be. And the wood is not going to protest. It'll take it. Okay. And I think lastly, there is this notion um, that Alfredo talked about, which is the idea of going by touch. There are going to be certain basic measurements that I'm going to work with to make this guitar fit. But when it comes right down to it, I'm going to rely on my own experience, my own senses, all of my senses, right? smell, sight, sound, all of the ways that a guitar maker is interacting with that wood um, to, make, to make intuitive decisions about how thin should this top be. How thick and where right, should this top be? How, how much am I going to carve this brace? How light? How heavy? Right? All of those decisions that are being made as you're working, right? are you constantly grabbing for a, a measure to see, am I getting it exactly right? No, you're, you're responding to the wood and you're trusting your own human judgment. A factory production, right? Increase, I don't know how many of you who have actually been in a guitar factory. I did tour and talk to many industrial guitar makers as part of this book, and their stories are represented here too. Um, but much of the basic production uh, of, of parts for acoustic guitars right, is done by computerized um, routers and lasers that right, it's all pre-programmed. There's no, there's no human decision making going on uh, in that process. Um, and, you know, I think there, there are, right, we can talk more about the difference between um, in industrial and artisanal um, processes, but, you know, that, that's a big one, right? You leave the decisions up to a computer program. It doesn't involve a human sensory touch. And I think when you, you take all of these values together, the, the notion of the uniqueness versus the interchangeability, the notion of the aliveness versus the deadness of the tone wood, and the sense of trusting human experience and the maker's touch 
versus mechanical reproduction. That all adds up to a very different kind of orientation toward, toward the instrument, toward what you're making. And I think of that, as I, as I said to the guitar makers on Friday uh, when I spoke to their symposium, you know, that that really, that's the, the difference here is it adds up to a feeling of play. Right? Instead of, I'm going to the work in the, in the morning and I'm going to make, you know, X number of guitars or I'm going to get so far in this guitar that I can finish it up tomorrow. Um, you know, there's a sense of, I can't wait to get up and go to the shop and have fun. Right? There's something fun about this. <laughs> or they wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing it. And have said as much. Is it like, if this stops being fun, you know, I'm going to stop doing it. Well, what, what is it that makes it fun? I think it is that playfulness, that let's see what's going to happen. I don't know if there's time to, to read another quote. I don't think so, but I'll just paraphrase. Um, another guitar maker that I talked to describes his experience of um, thinking of each guitar. He was, he's been doing it for almost 40 years, but is still as excited every morning uh, to be doing this. And he says, every guitar is like an experiment. Right? I just, I don't know what's going to happen. In Artisanal Luthery, he says, there are no absolutes. Right? We're always learning something. Our experience is growing and developing. And you know, he says, it's, it's, it's like a dance routine. You just do it. Um, it's something that's just you. And I thought that was such a beautiful way to talk about the experience of play as a sort of dancing with guitars. <laughs> you're not working on them. You're, you know, you're in, you're in this movement and motion with them where there's a lot of uh, intuitive, um, improvisational uh, kind of relationship. And I think that that sense of play is very different from what you hear from the guitar manufacturers in factories. Instead of play, it's all about let's be efficient. Right? Let's try to see how much we can, I mean, there, I suppose there's a sense of a game involved in this. Right? How much can we act, can produce in the shortest amount of time? Right? That's a form of a game, <laughs> right? But I, efficiency, I wouldn't call that the same thing as play, which is much more open-ended, uh, much less um, competitive. Uh, and I think that's why, just as an aside, I think that's why you see guitar makers from countries all over Europe and elsewhere, um, all standing next to each other, talking and laughing and sharing uh, information about what they do, is because this isn't competitive, right? These aren't, these aren't industrial producers guarding their secrets, secrets from one another, right? There's something not competitive uh, in, a very, in a very basic sense. And I think what that means for those of us who um, want to relate to our instruments in a different way, it certainly was true for me. I mean, I, I have to say the first guitar that I got when I was a teenager was a Martin guitar. It was just, there was no, I mean, that's what everybody else had, and they sounded good, and that's what you had. Um, and I was of the age where I was playing a lot of folk songs and basic chords, and it, it was a fine guitar for that purpose. But as I got older and really began hearing some of the wonderful music that is that seemed to develop along with the development of the artisanal guitar, uh, a finger style uh, approach to the steel string guitar, the flat top and arch top. You know, it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's classical guitar techniques applied to a steel string guitar that's just beautiful. I began to realize you, if you want to sound like that, of course, I'll never sound as good as some of those, those musicians, but you have to have the right instrument for it. There has to be an, an instrument that's going to allow you to grow in those, in those other ways. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, right, the idea of beginning to explore, you know, what, what, what's going into it. And I found myself really getting interested in, okay, so how are these guitars made? And what are they made with? And, and who actually is making them? And I realized, like, 
You mean you can actually meet the person who made the guitar, and it's one person that you could know, and you can meet them here at a guitar show, uh, or you could email them and they'd respond, and you could describe what you're looking for, and they could say, well, let's think about that. What, what could we do? Um, and you could, right, there's different woods, and you have all these choices and selections. I mean, it can be mind-boggling, but if you find somebody who you feel you can work with, uh, it, can be a, it, it can be a wonderful experience. And I, I realized after doing this project and thinking about what the luthiers themselves are valuing, um, as a customer, as a consumer, you know, I'm realizing that my values are very similar. Right? I, want, I, I want a unique guitar. Right? I want a guitar that's not like every other guitar. Um, I want a guitar that feels lively in my hands, right? that responds to my touch, that feels alive. And I want to know who made it. I want to know that there was a human being selecting that wood, thinking about what they were going to do with that wood, interacting with that wood in such a way that you know, what, what, what happened was not what some computer program decided, but what some human being decided. And those artisanal values, it seems to me, when they are valued by a consumer, uh, begins to create an alternative market for the handmade guitar, an alternative market that supports the livelihoods uh, of artisans. And in, in North America, it was probably about 1990 when Acoustic Guitar Magazine was formed and there became this consciousness that there are builders out there. They'd been doing it since the 70s, but were kind of flying under the radar. Um, but by about 1990, you know, Play, you know, experienced professional players, collectors, and normal <laughs> so-so guitar players like me um, suddenly became aware that this is happening and a market is being created. And if I, if I put my money where my values are, right, I am, I'm contributing to the creation of this luthery world. Right? We can think of it uh, as an art world um, and that you are supporting your values that allow other people right, to live theirs. And I think there, there is something that then happens. We're, we're playing with the same values. We are literally playing with the instrument. The instrument leaves the luthier's bench, gets put into our hands, and we're continuing that experience of play. And there is something magical about that, right? You, because you've, you've connected right, to the whole process that brought it into being. And now the play is between you and your instrument. Um, and it's up to you to kind of put your soul into it, right, to feel that, that sense of emotional connection with the guitar. Um, but I think that whole story um, becomes one that is very powerful. I don't know if any of you have a handmade guitar um, or are thinking about one. Um, but I think if you approach it uh, with that mindset, that you will find that there's something, there's something different that's happening. Um, so that's, that's my sense of what the magic is. Um, it's, the, it's the player's sense of play. Uh, you know, I've, I interviewed a number of professional musicians who use, and uh, they don't just buy one, uh, artisanal guitar, they have quite a few artisanal <laughs> guitars, um, but they will often say, almost echoing, right, the same words of the luthier, this guitar has so many songs in it that, I, that have, yet to be, have yet to be realized, right? I know that this guitar will have some songs in it, and I just need to listen to the guitar until I can find out what they are, right? Which is, right, it, it's the exact, it's a mirror version of the luthier saying, I know this guitar has great sounds and possibilities, I just need to draw it out. And the player is saying exactly the same thing. Um, I think that there's, right, that's, you know, what is magic? I, I, I should, I, another confession I need to make. Um, 
<laughs> and then I, and they will end. Um, when I was a kid, I got really into magic, and so I did do a magic show myself, mostly for kids' birthday parties. But I was always not so much interested in how does this trick work, uh, or how do you do it, but how can I imagine what a kid would find really exciting, and how can I make that happen, right? I'm going to, I'm going to pop a balloon, and a dove is going to appear, and it's like, oh, yes, right? And it's sort of imagining, imagining, giving that kind of pleasure um, through uh, what what you're doing. And I, I suspect if we think about play, um, a play which is open-ended, play in which anything in your imagination can happen, um, that is a definition of magic. And when you're playing, you're playing these instruments. I think there's a possibility for a lot to happen. So with that. Um, let me turn it over to you and ask you if you have any experiences to share or questions about what luthery in the United States and Canada is like, or if there are luthiers here, how it might be different um, in Europe. Any questions? I think, I, I don't know, just picking up on what you were saying, I think in some ways, there's almost like a rebellion going on. Mm. I think probably because we live in a world full of marketing and commodity and everything seems to be going that way. For me, there seems to be like a, almost this, you know, the custom builder is almost fighting against that. And there's a sense that there's people who are wanting to buy those guitars also are part of that rebellion against that commercialization. Total. I, I agree. I agree completely. And I'm, in the book, I talk about this as a as a social and political movement. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a Luthery movement. There is an effort, you know, and it's not just in Luthery. Right? The, the I think the artisanal values that I talk about here um, are true whether it's cheese, um, whether it's handmade furniture, whether it's handmade blue jeans. Um, you know, I think there is uh, certainly a desire on the part of makers and consumers to say we want to do things differently. Um, and we want to right, not just have the products be different, but we want to have a different relationship with production. We want to know how it's happening. And I think with, you know, it started in food. Right? We want to know where this is coming from. We want to know what it's being made with. Right? Are these genetically modified organisms? And how are you treating those cows? <laughs> um, right, this is serious stuff. Right? Um, where are you getting these resources? From what parts of the world? And what kind of politics you know, is, is behind the consumption choices that I'm making? Uh, I do think there's a revolution uh, in the way consumers are approaching uh, the market. And this is one you small part of it. use the word, uh, I'm a Luthier, so I view it from that point of view. And, and I have to concur with much of what you say. <clears throat> it sounds very much like thoughts I've had. Um, to me, it's something where when, you, when I talk about the people who buy my guitars or people who <laughs> buy guitars, basically, <clears throat> I don't think of them as consumers, but as customers. Mm. I always found the word consumer. A consumer is somebody who um, buys something because he's being told to buy it in a way. <clears throat> I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I lost my voice. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, there's a difference there in terms yeah. of seeing somebody, when you say, I listen to the wood, um, Part of consumer society, so I'm not listening to a person I'm mm. deciding what what would fit for that person, and I'm uh, I'm marketing it then to that person mm -hmm. based on something where you have a common denominator that leaves individuality and uniqueness out of the equ equation because that does not work; it does not mix. Right. Whereas with a customer, and it comes into the word, the custom instrument is something where you look at a person, you recognize their uniqueness. Yes. And their specific, uh, I had a conversation with a dealer today who's very good. And he told me, yes, a guy came into my shop and you know, 
he wanted to buy a Telecaster. So I give him, I have custom shop Telecasters, and I give him, and after the fourth, I see there's no gleam in his face. Mm. So then he handed him a handmade guitar. And that's the one the customer walked out with. He said, suddenly, there was that gleam, mm. that mm. personal connection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think a lot of the show is about is about rediscovering that also. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a real desire, uh, I think, that we all have to have that kind of relationship um, with, with the products that we, that we buy. Um, and knowing, knowing who made them uh, makes, makes a really, really big difference because then you become part of that story, right? Part of the maker story and part of the network of people who uh, right, are making this happen. You, you do become part of a community um, once, you, once you sort of make that step uh, into this world. And it's, it's an exciting thing that we don't often experience. And it's very different than the kind of community that's formed around you know, a mass-produced object, right? where it's really the brand. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wear a Mercedes sweatshirt, because uh, I, I really dig Mercedes. Uh, but you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you kind of go to a Mercedes plant, you meet a few of the, 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 the workers, and you get a sense of how the thing is made, and you can repair that engine yourself. Uh, you know, maybe it means something more to you then. But my suspicion is for most people who are just buying the symbol, it just means luxury. It just means this is elite. Uh, right? There's not a connection with a, a community of other people who are valuing similar things. Um, that's a big difference. Anything else? I will be signing copies of this book uh, at the table. Uh, there, if any of you would like to come take a look at it or talk to me uh, in person, I'd be happy to continue uh, the conversation. Well, okay. actually, you read the book. And, uh, it's a great book. <laughs> the best <laughs> books about what it is like to be a luthier and uh, to not just see the, you know, the little workbench thing, but what is your life and how does it fit into the world around us? So I highly recommend it. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have such a wonderful fan. <laughs> the, the, fee the feeling is mutual. Right? Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.